A CNN team witnessed Israeli soldiers with Palestinian detainees who were blindfolded and barefoot. UN human rights officials have previously urged Israel to end what they called the mistreatment of Palestinians, which included the use of blindfolds. CNN's Jeremy Diamond has this reporting for us and joins us now live. Uh, Jeremy, what did you learn? Well, uh, Fred, my team and I were in southern Israel today near the border with Gaza when suddenly we spotted more than two dozen men, some of them kneeling, some of them sitting on the ground with Israeli soldiers standing around them. We now know that these men were Palestinians detained by the Israeli military in Gaza and brought to Israel for further questioning. Now, if you look at the video here that we have, these men were blindfolded, they were barefoot. And keep in mind that it was about 50 degrees Fahrenheit uh, during this day, and all they're wearing are these disposable white coveralls. Uh, their hands are tied behind their backs, and you can see that many of these men are clearly physically exhausted. Their heads kind of nodding down, bobbing, swaying. Uh, one man was lying on the ground before an Israeli soldier comes to rouse him, propping him back up uh, so that he can be uh, sitting on the ground. Now, the Israeli military told us this in a statement saying, quote, these in the individuals shown on camera are suspected of terrorist activity and were arrested in Gaza and transferred to Israel for further interrogation. Relevant suspects are taken for further questioning within Israel. Individuals who are found not to be taking part in terrorist activities are released back into Gaza as soon as possible. Now, they also address the conditions in which we found these detainees, uh, talking about the fact that they were wearing these white coveralls because they had been stripped, uh, their clothing searched to ensure that they were not carrying weapons or explosives, and they said that they would be given clothing uh, once they arrived at that detention facility. They also said that when we came across them that they were about to be put on a heated bus uh, in order to be taken to that detention facility. We weren't able to see exactly how long these men were actually on the ground there for, and that's because an Israeli soldier came to us and demanded uh, that we leave the pre premises once he saw us filming. Now, as it relates to Israel's, uh, the Israeli military's claims here that these are terror suspects, it's important to note that we have, uh, while this is the first time that we have been able to unilaterally directly document these detentions, there have been a lot of videos of uh, Palestinian men and boys in Gaza detained by the Israeli military, and in many cases, they have proven to be civilians. They have been identified by their friends or relatives in videos as civilians. We also interviewed 10 Palestinian men and boys back in December who said that they were uh, arrested and detained by the Israeli military for five days without charge before being ultimately released. When they were released, uh, those men and boys had swollen wrists, bruises on their wrists in some cases, uh, from the fact that their hands were tied behind their backs for the duration of that detention. Now, the Israeli military, for its part, insists that it, uh, it proceeds uh, with international law in all of these cases. Fred? Mm. And, and then, uh, Jeremy, separately, more countries are pausing funding for the United Nation uh, relief agencies operating in Gaza. The IDF you know, said today that uh, those facilities were used for terrorist purposes. What do you know about that? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the United Kingdom is now also joining the United States in temporarily pausing funding to UNRWA, uh, which is uh, the main agency responsible for Palestinian refugees. But they have been playing, of course, a critical role in Gaza right now, providing shelter, providing uh, food and other humanitarian assistance uh, that is so desperately needed at this moment. But of course, this all comes after these bombshell allegations yesterday that 12 uh, UNRWA staffers uh, were involved in the October seventh terrorist attacks carried out by Hamas. That's according to intelligence that Israel shared not only with the United States, but also uh, with UNRWA directly. And following that information, UNRWA went on to uh, fire uh, some of those staffers. We don't know exactly how many, but they, they did say that they fired multiple staffers uh, in part uh, because they want to ensure that humanitarian assistance can continue to flow into Gaza. UNRWA, for its part, has pledged a full investigation into this matter and has vowed to hold any of those responsible accountable for this. But today we're also getting reaction from Hamas, which is condemning Israel's uh, threats against uh, that UN agency. Uh, Israel has said that they uh, would like to end UNRWA's role in Gaza altogether and is calling on countries to end funding to that agency. Mm -hmm. Fred.
All right, Jeremy Diamond, uh, thank you so much for your reporting. All right, in Gaza, the Palestine Red Crescent Society is appealing for protection for the Al Amal Hospital in Han Yunus in Gaza. The aid agency says Israeli bombing in the area has endangered its medical staff and the 7,000 people who are taking shelter there. Separately, at least nine people were killed and another 75 injured this week when Israeli tank fire hit the UN shelter that was harboring hundreds of people. That's according to the UN. Streams of Palestinians fled the area in southern Gaza following the attack. The Israeli military said it is looking into the incident and said it wasn't the result of a strike by Israeli forces. I want to bring in uh, Jada McKenna. She is the CEO of Mercy Corps. Uh, so good to see you. So there's an aid organization that has been working in Gaza and the West Bank for uh, more than 30 years. What, what have your aid workers been telling you about the attack on the shelter and the aftermath? You know, increasingly, Palestinians have been moved into smaller and smaller spaces. Um, and for this to happen, it's just another example where there are very few places for them physically to be. And to see them continually getting bombed, it just escalates this feeling that nowhere is safe and, and the anxiety of the hardship of living amidst a war situation. Mm -hmm. After the attack, you know, you reiterated that Gazans are trapped. They have nowhere to go. And the same applies to some of your aid workers. Um, what are they doing to try to stay safe and how are you able to communicate with people? So we some, we some of them have, you know, different SIM cards from other countries to get around telecoms plans because the Israel, I mean, Israel has shut down telecommunications for, for weeks or days at a time at times. You know, they talk about spending a lot of time each day looking for food. They talk about fretting over safe shelter. Um, they try to get word about their relatives and others. And they are also just complain. They're also starting to get sick. I have one staff member who said everyone in her family has either a skin infection or some other kind of infection. Mm -hmm. So this prolonged period of harsh winter weather with no safe shelter, not enough water, not enough food, it's taking its toll on people in many different dimensions. Uh, you are among many who have called for an immediate ceasefire. Uh, something you've been demanding you know, for some time now. Uh, do you feel like your plea and that of many um, is even being heard? Um, or do you believe that at some point there will be a ceasefire if it doesn't happen, happen more immediately? It's very disheartening. And, you know, at this point, all, all 2 million people of Gaza are in need of humanitarian aid to launch a response and to serve that many people, that is something outside of the purview of aid organizations. There is no way for us to do that safely in the absence of a total ceasefire. People won't know where to go for safety, our staff will be at risk, and it will be chaotic. So it's really disheartening that our pleas for this have been unheard because the longer this goes on, the more that is an absolute precondition for anything. And you say one of the you know things that hampers your organization is a lack of access, you know, lack of access points, you know, for for Gaza aid. Um, can you kind of paint a picture for people who still have a hard time envisioning, you know, what these obstacles are, uh, and in what ways can aid be rendered rendered? So just to start with getting supplies in, on a normal, Gaza was always dependent on those crossings for all of their commercial goods and everything else. So on a normal day, 500 trucks, including like regular grocery store restocking, would go through to Gaza, to go into Gaza every day. At this point, we're averaging about 130 trucks a day, just of aid, not of any commercial things. There are hundreds of trucks lined up at the Egyptian border some items have been indiscriminately banned from those trucks. So uh, sleeping bags were rejected for having metal zippers. Um, tents were respected for were were rejected for having metal poles. So a truck gets to that inspection station, something gets disqualified, and then they have to go all the way to the back of the line. On top of that, where are we as aid workers to tell people to go to collect aid? 
Uh, earlier in your segment, you talked about a UN shelter getting bombed. You have a hospital getting bombed. Where do we feel comfortable telling people that they can go and be safe to get these supplies? So people are so desperate. They're even mobbing the trucks that are coming in, but we just have no visibility to how we safely transport because areas that should have been deconflicted continue to be bombed. Mm. And then what about uh, medical care? So this is, you know, at this point, um, the UN is warming that a fa warning that a famine could be coming. But at this point, your people are so depleted of food and resources um, and no medical care that they're dying. You're starting to see people dying of secondary things like diarrheal diseases, um, infections, and and with the lack of medical care or medical supplies. They are hopeless. Very People are going to die from very simple infections that could have been handled with antibiotics. Mm, terrible. All right. Uh, Jada McKenna, uh, thank you so much. And I know you and so many uh, non-government agencies are working so hard to try to render whatever care and assistance you can. And it is an uphill battle. Thank you so much for your time.